So welcome everybody. Um, good morning or good evening, wherever you are to this um, very, very first event of um, this year's 154 um, um, forum. And um, I'm Julia, this is Yvette. Hi. And um, <laughs> we're the curators of this year's uh, 154 forum and very happy for and thankful for the invitation to be able to um, invite bringing together these um, amazing uh, voices and um, participants from literally all over the world um, who join us today and um, for mm -hmm. the next two and a half days to um, discuss um, different topics around artistic production from Latin America, the Caribbean and um, Africa and the global diaspora. So there's a lot to talk about and to discuss. And we're extremely happy that for um, today, uh, for the first event, we could uh, win the fantastic Ade de Delgado in front of this fantastic artwork, which looks amazing together, um, um, to conduct or to um, introduce us um, into her work um, um, with a keynote. Um, and we're very looking forward to it. Um, she will elaborate um, on the term of Latinx in the context of contemporary artistic and cultural production, talking about the implications and opportunities of this relatively new expression. And we're very looking forward to it. And um, yeah, welcome again, Aldeida. And thanks so much that you, you're there. Hello, also again from my side. Um, I will just give you a brief outline of Aldeida's biography. Um, actually, we know her work because she has been writing for Sierra America Latina a couple of times. So we really loved her text and her writing and are super happy that we finally got the opportunity to invite her to speak about her work. So Aldeida is an art historian. She's a curator, she's a researcher um, and her work focuses on ethnic identity, feminism and the representation of women in the visual arts. She also founded and runs the Women Photographers International Archive, an organization for the research, promotion, and support of Cuban women photographers. She studied art history at the University of Havana and currently lives in Miami. So you're really in a different time zone than we are. So, so thanks for that. Um, and just maybe for you as the audience to know, uh, you're welcome to send in questions. So we will gather them and then uh, can ask them after the talk. So we would be happy if you kind of really join in in a conversation once the keynote um, is finished. As you've maybe also seen, um, the talk is being recorded. So share with your friends who couldn't make it today uh, that they actually can also have a look at the keynote um, later on on YouTube and various channels of 154 Art Fair. So Adele, the, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you all of you that are here today. Um, well, please uh, feel free to um, introduce, put your name in the chat and also let us know from which place, where place of the world are you seeing us? And thank you Julia, uh, Julia and Ivette for organizing this uh, much needed event at the intersection of African and Latin American, also for creating an unprecedented dialogue, dialogue space for um, critical voices through contemporary and, and specifically contemporary and America Latina, that is the magazine which I contribute to. Also, thank you, Olivia, for all the support in terms of the logistic for organizing this conference. And uh, thank you to my team, to Francis, to Francisco Maso, my partner, and thank you um, all of you. So I will start um, as the title of this um, presentation evidence. I will be speaking in the following 45 minutes. Um, one moment. So I will be speaking in the following 45 minutes about the term Latinx and the implications and opportunities of this new relative young expression through the lens of my personal experience. It is the journey of how I transited through being Black, Cuban, Caribbean, Hispanic, Latina, and Latinx, and how I complexified all of these classifications rather than consider um, each 
as independent opposite categories. So during the uh, presentation, you will see that I will be using the terms Hispanic, Latina, Latino, Latinx, and that is um, in relation to the specific context, historical context in which these um, terms have been implemented. Also, I have been uh, respectful with the bibliography. So in the case that the bibliography reference Hispanic, I decide to keep that mention in the original way. And also during all this conference, I will be making reference to the specific context of the Latinx uh, phenomenon, specifically in the US. So let's see what is happening here. Okay. I want to start this reflection by referencing a visit I did two weeks ago to the current exhibition Rest Assured by the Afro Cuban American Latinx multidisciplinary artist Juana Valdez. And I will repeat that once again Afro Cuban American Latinx multidisciplinary artist Juana Valdez presented in the Alternative Art Space Locus Project in Miami. Born in Pinar del Rio, Juana Valdez came to Miami in 1971 during the second wave of Cuban migration that took place from 1965 to 1974, a, um, a wave that brought middle and working class Cubans to the United States. She later received her Bachelor in Fine Arts in Sculpture from the Parsons School of Design, her Master in Fine Arts uh, from the School of Visual Arts, and she attended the Schoolingham School of Painting and Sculpture, all of this in the US. And this is so important what I am referencing, these elements in terms of her education, because that is related with uh, which we'll be considering as a Latinx, as an, as a Latinx artist. So Rest Assured is a continuation of Juana Valdez's explorations of the topics of migration, racialization, and trade and capitalism that have, that have informed her practice thus far, as well as an exploration of the significance of the ocean in the way that we conceive and imagine the Caribbean. Most significant to me in the context of this, uh, of the topic that we are discussing was to find upon entering, uh, entering the space, a multimedia a sculpture of televisions where each screen showed archival materials about the Cuban migration experience in the US. Also along the walls, as you see here, uh, but this displayed uh, statistics that frame this migration experience within a specific US governmental policies that reinforce the privilege of Cuban about all the population from Latin America in the US. These two elements, the statistics and the televisions, are crucial as they encourage conversation about the influence of the US census and of Spanish language media in the invention of the Hispanic identity in the US, as I will explain later on. For now, let's maintain focus on the identifying expression Hispanic of Cuban origin that you can see here. And, um, who refers to uh, those immigrants to the US from Cuba and those who trace their family ancestry to the island. And also let's pay attention to the statistics in how 86% of Cuban identified themselves as white when asked about their race in the US census. In my experience, it's not uncommon to encounter people who ask me, are you Cuban? And after I respond that I am, soon thereafter they say, oh, I didn't know there were black people in Cuba. Similarly, I uh, recall during her presentation in the 2016 for Foundation US Latinx Art Future Symposium organized by artist Teresita Fernandez, how frequently uh, she was interjected by expressions such as, you don't sound Cuban, you don't look Cuban which basically means you are not white. I am explaining this because you either become the representation of diversity in events 
or you become inauthentic in a contemporary art world that values national identifications over diasporic and racialized identifications. I have been working on the project catalog of Cuban women photographers since 2013. It is the first comprehensive approach to Cuban photography from a feminist perspective, showcasing the contributions of women working on the medium of photography from the 19th century through the present. I didn't know Juana's work until I came to the US in 2016. In fact, her work is better included in art exhibitions in Cuba or in US art exhibitions that don't address race, gender, or origin as an identity marker to organize the show. As a scholar, Arlene Davila has written in relation to exhibitions and the art market. And by the way, I recommend you all to read the last book that she published. Um, she said, one would think that as a Cuban American, Juana Valdez would have benefited from the growing popularity of Cuban art among collectors of Latin American art. Cuban art has been given more attention than most other Latin American countries and the rest of the Caribbean due to the state funding and infrastructure that Cuba provides for this, for this particularly through the celebration of Havana's biennial and the consistent patronage of wealthy Cuban collectors in El Sai. However, the fetish for Cuban art discovered and purchased on the island along with the Cuban government's policies of a rusher towards Cuban artists after they have migrated or resigned, have effectively reinforced the invisibility of Cuban artists living in the US. Also, Davila affirms, Valdez's war foregrounds race, color, and empire in most of her pieces as the formative experience that are central to her Cuban identity of the Iceland and the reality of what is to live as a black person in America. In Juana's view, these topics find little room within the category of Latin American art, which tends to embrace a wider South American version of identity and doesn't highlight Latin American African roots. So, what does the Latinx category offers to artists like Juana Valdez and curators like me? How do we renegotiate our identities by embracing the Latinx? Latinx is a gender neutral alternative that refers to individuals of Latin American origin who were born, educated, or nationalized in the US and who don't identify with feminine and masculine gender constructions as denoted in the use of the Spanish words Latina and Latino. According to Google Trends, the X at the end of the phrase initially gained popularity in the LGBTQIA community and in academic circles around 2004 to designate gender diversity. But it was more recently, from 2016 onwards, that its popularity significantly increased following the mass shooting at Pulse and LGBTQ nightclub in Orlando, Florida, that was hosting its regular Latin night the date of the attack. The rise in prominence of Latinx discussion coincides with the hosting migration policies towards Latin America that Donald Trump has consistently campaigned on and has established during his administration. According to statistics released by the Pew Research Center, in 2017, there were nearly 60 million people identified as Latinos in the United States, amounting to approximately 18% of the total population becoming the second largest ethnic group in the country behind those classified as white. It is also worth noting the growing population of US born people of Latin descent who accounted for 65.6% in 2015 in contrast with 34.4% uh, of people identified as immigrants. 
Another study from the Pew Research Center in 2018 revealed that 67% of Latinos recon recognize the current administration policies as harmful to them, a much higher figure recorded than during previous presidential administrations. In this national context, the Dominican American Latinx artist Elia Alba organized the event Latin America Immigration and Race at the Shelley Donald Rubin Foundation as part of the project The Super Club, which consists of a series of thematic conversations organized around dinner events where approximately 500 artists, writers, critics, and curators have attended to discuss identity, race, and visual culture. This specific conversation that I am referencing here problematized the notion of pigmentocracy, colonialism, and Latinidad prompted by fundamental questions such as, sorry, at what point do you allow people to self-identify? At what point is that self-identification imposed and to what degree? And who sets the terms of identification? The term Latinx is an alternative to traditional labor such as Hispanic and Latino, which emerged around the mid 20th century to describe Latin American migrant communities in the United States. The less popular term Hispanic was adopted in the 1970s by the US government to refer to those communities whose language and heritage associated them with Spain. The US census had a tremendous impact on the process of construction and institutionalization of the Hispanic identity during the 1970s. Before that period, reports classified Mexican, Cuban, and Puerto Rican immigrants as white, grouping them with European Americans. And as you see this chart that I am showing, that I am presenting you, um, the Hispanic or Latino we can say people descent from Latin America is, is identified with this green box. And the, of course, this process starts in the 1970s and only we can find a reference in the 1930s, in the 1930s when um, it appears this category as Mexican. As a result of changes to immigration law during the 60s, which led to an increased population from Latin America, Asia, and Africa, as well as the political impact of the Black Power Movement, the Chicano Movement, the La Raza Movement, and Puerto Rican radicalism, among others, efforts were made to install new federal legislation for the collections, analysis, and publication of accurate statistical data about minority groups and their concerns. Thus, in the early 70s, President Richard Nixon responded to the pressure of Mexican American activist organizations by including an item in the long form of the census to count Hispanics. According to the sociologist Ruben uh, Rumbaut, in the essay, The Making of a People, the 1970 census evidence, evidence that more than 12 million Americans identified themselves as being of a Spanish speaking background and traced their origin or descent from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Central and South America, and other Spanish speaking countries. That a larger number of them suffer from racial, social, economic, and political discrimination and are denied the basic opportunities that they deserve as American citizens. And that an accurate determination of the urgent and special needs of Americans of Spanish origin and descent was needed to improve their economic and social status. However, as the Hispanic term become official through the influence of the Spanish language television channels and its implementation in the 1980s uh, US census, debate was generated because this category emphasized the Spanish element, as you notice, 
while neglecting indigenous and African roots centered in Latin America. Beginning in 1993, a process of revision of the category Hispanic started culminating with the adoption by 1997 by the Bureau of the Census of the two ethnic categories, Hispanic and Latino, and not Hispanic or Latino. According to the census, Latino defines a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American, or other Spanish culture or origin, regardless of race, as you see here. The term Latino in opposition to Hispanic met greater acceptance in the Latin community and in the academic field. It transcended the linguistic barrier by including, from a geographical point of view, the Spanish speaking population along with the Portuguese speaking groups, as well as those with indigenous dialects. One of the many reflections provoked by the Hispanic Heritage Month over the years, that by the way, we are in that moment right now, and of course is provoking discussion once again, an article was published by David Gonzalez in the New York Times in 1992, evidencing the problem with Hispanic. According to the author, the Census Bureau imposed the word Hispanic, although people, mostly young people, prefer Latino. And this is important because um, in my conversations with some of the artists, they consider that maybe Latinx is a generational phenomenon. They think, oh, the most younger artists, they are using Latinx. And in another generation, maybe they consider still uh, being um, identified or they identify themselves as Latino or Latina. Um, according to David Gonzalez, the uh, term Latino was frequently used in neighborhoods and homes and its pronunciation in Spanish was perceived as an affirmation of identity and as a form of empathy. And I recall uh, the experience shared by the um, Cuban Latina artist Nereida Garcia Ferraz uh, about her experience living in Chicago during the 80s. In her words, being Latina in Chicago was a very complex thing because there was a huge Mexican neighborhood. There was a very large Puerto Rican community and there were around 15,000 Cubans all around the city. At that time, she said, it was a very political situation that wasn't what I really expected when we got there. Somehow, she says, I was thrown by reality, by my going into the city into a highly political Latino situation. And I had to learn how to survive myself as a Latina, not just as a Cuban, but how to integrate, how to help, how to connect with the community out there. And I think that's crucial because that's part of the same process that, for example, I experimented. It is about how I become involved, how I adapt to a new uh, society. So in the importance, and specifically in this cold climate, we think on uh, the context of Chicago. Uh, on the importance of creating community and finding a space during this moment, I would like to reference this uh, series that I presented for the first time in the uh, exhibition that I curated last year, Building a Feminist Archive, Cuban Women Photographers in the US. This series called uh, El Picnic, it's a photo essay created by Nereida Garcia in collaboration with the artist Eugenia Vargas, a Chilean born photographer based at that time in Mexico, and Laura Gonzalez, a Mexican born photography student at that time at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. All these artists had uh, different bodies of work. However, in El Picnic, they chose photography as a collaborative tool to interact with each other and also with the environment. During the piece, they work all morning through the quicksand, photographing nature, their movement, their bodies, and a picnic was the central moment of that visit. Surrounded by Polaroid photos and photographic equipment, 
Nereida, Eugenia, and Laura sat around a picnic basket and made a celebratory toast to the wonderful energy that unite them. Another word that I want to highlight is the uh, photonovela Paquiti Chata Se Arrebata by Cuban American interdisciplinary artist and writer Coco Fusco, made in collaboration with San Francisco Chicana performance artist Na Bustamante. This project also was the first time that I exhibited, uh, that was exhibited in the exhibition that I curated. And it's important to see how I am presenting two artists with a project in 1989 uh, and this project by 1996. And these both projects have been presented for the first time last year, which has speak about the lack of recognition, the lack of visibility that Latinx, Latina, Latino artists are having in the institutions in the US and how needed they are of um, critics, of voices to know about the practice, to research, to create a scholarship. So that's one of the reasons for which this, uh, all this discussion is so important. So Coco Fusco challenged the stereotypical representation of women and non-Western people in the media and in mainstream culture and the notion of a monolithic Latino identity. In this case, the series deals with uh, the um, stereotypical representations that link women, Latin women and food to the erotic in the Western imagination. Paquita uh, Ichata Se Arrebatan was originally produced for a special issue of the magazine Atlantic International dedicated to Latin America. In this uh, series, Coco and Chao and, and now embodied Paquita and Chata, those commonly sold in Latin folk art shops, which are representation of sex workers from the poor city of Veracruz in Mexico. This uh, paper mache dolls depict, uh, depict boost, uh, boosty, cute Latinas, mostly Mexicans with dark curly hair and their names hand painted um, across their undersheets. It constitutes a reflection on the history of the Latina representation as an oversex, as a sex spot in visual culture and popular media. So, Going back to the question, at what point do you allow people to self-identify? At what point is that self-identification imposed and to what degree? And who sets the terms of identification? So far, I have referenced the origins of the US Latin term through the Hispanic and Latino nomenclatures established during the 1970s and the 1990s respectively. It should be said that none of these categories were agreed upon by consensus. Also, my explanation here doesn't pretend in any sense establish, to establish a linear history of the events, as in some cases it has been demonstrated that these categories coexist with more or less popularity in various populations. In other instances, people prefer to describe their identity based on their family uh, country of origin to say, I am from Venezuela, I am Venezuelan, I am Argentinian, I am Mexican. Or simply, they want to identify referencing their personal ties to the United States of America. It should be also understood that these terms comprise a diversity of experience in terms of culture, class, and race. And it's not my goal to essentialize the complexities of this experience. Answering to this question, my focus has been based on the institutionalization of these terms, Hispanic and Latino, and, in, and its instrumentalization through mass media and the US census, and I will add in all the governmental system of data collection. One can understand Latinx without recognizing the historical role of activism in the fight against structural racism and to empower Latin American descendant communities that have paved the way for the movement we have today. 
Latinx is a result of the demands to the federal government made by Mexican Americans and other at that time called Hispanic organizations to claim equal rights, healthcare, employment, and better conditions from people, uh, for people from Latin America living and working in this country. And that's why I want to mention this work by Miguel Luciano, which was a public intervention in El Barrio, where he um, honors the um, group, the Young Lords, which uh, constitute a group of young Puerto Rican activists who organized for social justice in their communities during the late 1970s and 1970s. Assuming a Latino identity for some artists, for example, in the case that I show you, Nereida Garcia Ferraz, has been a strategy of survival in order to avoid becoming erased in a colonial, patriarchal, and racist system. As um, a scholar, Adriana Zavala has explained, unless we embrace the Latinat category, the extraordinary accomplishment of many artists will continue to be relegated to the margins of both Latin American and American art history. And I want you to notice how she used the word Latinat. This um, text was written in 2015, and uh, that's the nomenclature that she's using. Before the X in Latin X, other endings such as at, e, and u in the words Latinat, Latine, and Latino were used in the early 2000s to create an inclusive feminine and masculine space. However, although pronouncing Latino and Latina in Spanish was perceived as a form of identity affirmation, for those who don't identify with the gender binary, this word has failed to represent them. Thus, the implementation of Latinx. Latinx, like Latino and Hispanics, is a social politically constructed concept and a product of the marginalizing conditions of the designated community. This panethnic label problematized the notion of an homogeneous and fixed Latin identity. It involves a qualification of the Latin, which means to reveal the crossing of identities that the migratory experience produced as well as to denaturalize the binaries of sex and gender and include other variables such as social class, skin color, ethnicity, sexuality, age, legal status, among others, in the understanding of being Latin. Thus, at the same time, it is a political positioning and an intellectual project. Arlene Davila, quoting curator Carmen Ramos, posits, I use the term Latino art, and I will add Latinx art, not as a sign of cultural essence, but as an indicator of the, um, but as an indicator of descent, shared experience, and our historical marginalizations. And she continues, no person of Latin American background in the US is born Latinx. They become Latinized by being racialized into, or socialized, or a culture into US racial frameworks and by developing articulating identification within larger, uh, larger uh, Latinx communities. In the last five years, our critics, curators, and scholars in general have worked to address the underrepresentation of Latinx artists in mainstream museums, collections, and exhibitions, as demonstrated by several, although honestly, insufficiently, art events. However, not everybody agrees with the term. In fact, a recent study published uh, in August of 2020. Uh, claims that only 23% of US adults who self identified as Hispanic or Latino have heard of the term Latinx, and just 3% of them use it to uh, describe themselves. 
According to Salvador Vida Ortiz and Juliana Martinez in the article, Latin X Toes, Latin with an X, the phonetic and visual dissonance produced by the X in the term Latin X the construct denormalization of gender in a linguistic system ideologically and sociopolitically marked by um, androcentrism and heteronormativity. Nevertheless, and even though Latinx is proposed as an inclusive cultural category, it is worth asking to what extent it is an efficient terminology to battle the hierarchies of oppression, for example, in connection to anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. In the article, when it comes to Latinidad, who is included and who isn't, and by the way, I will be sharing a list of resources uh, with all this bibliographic reference for all of you that wants to know more about this topic. Uh, Janet Martinez discussed in this article how members of the Latinx community with greater privilege are white, heterosexual, cisgender, rich, and able-bodied men. The closer you are to this idea, Martin Martinez argues, the greater your opportunities are. On the other hand, there is a risk of reducing Latinx exclusively to people who are sexually non-normative or in other words, to conflate sexual orientation with gender identity by assuming that queer or non-binary um, that queer and non-binary people are necessarily gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc. Another argument against the use of the term Latinx focus on its alleged imperialist or colonial character. Proponents of this argument claim that the term Latinx is an anglicism that forced the strict non-gender rules of the Spanish language onto the, uh, sorry, the non-gender strict rules of the English language onto the Spanish language. This criticism, which defends the purity of language as its grammat grammatical structure, seems to forget that the implantation of Castilian over indigenous language was part of the modernity colonialist enterprise in Latin America. Also, the debate how about Latinx has gained prominence in the US um, context for political, cultural, and economic reasons, Latin America has developed its own strategies for the creation of an inclusive language. For example, the use of X and the use of E in TODEX and uh, TODES, for example. The application of these linguistic solutions, in my opinion, neither constitutes a degradation nor the death of the Spanish grammatical system. On the contrary, it is a sign of its adaptability and capacity for transformation in response to social circumstances. For others, such as uh, California activist Motecuzoma Sanchez, in the text, The Issue with Latinx, Latinx is an elitist uh, attempt, in his opinion, to silence a history of political claims made by Mexican Americans and Puerto Rican, as well as a distraction intended to divert attention away from other urgent problems that Latin people face in the US day, every day. In the current political scenario, the use of categories such as Latinx can appear suspicious in terms of the ghettoization of a growing community in the country and thereby limit is, um, this community access to institutions rooted in a white heterosexual and masculine paradigm. This argument is explained by events such as the Hispanic Heritage Month or Black History Month or uh, Women's History Month which constitute the only moments during the year when, when these institutions dedicate their programming to make visible these groups. So personally, I believe that there is another superstitious question on there, what is Latinx? And that question is, what is Latin America? In the book, 
queer Latinidad, identity practices and discursive spaces, author uh, Juana Maria Rodriguez asks, if Dominicanas are Latinas, are Haitianas Latinas too? Are multilingual Iceland that defied easy classification such as Aruba, Curaçao, and Trinidad part of the Latino world? Or the English and Creole speaking countries such as Guyana, Suriname, and Belize? Or the polylingual regions of Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama? I want to highlight three exhibitions that challenge the spectrum Latin America, Latinx. The first one is relational undercurrents contemporary art of the Caribbean archipelago curated by Tatiana Flores during Pacific Standard Time Latin America Los Angeles in 2017. According to Tatiana Flores, the exhibition calls attention to the narrow and exclusionary concept of Latin America as a place south of the border that encompasses the Spanish Americas and Brazil by remapping the region to hone in on the Caribbean islands. The exhibition includes Latinx identified artists that I will show you now with the um, goal that you can write their names and you can go and see on their websites and trying to learn more about their practice and their words and this um, will encourage you uh, to learn more about this uh, topic. Some of the artists, uh, some of the artists were Ale Guerrier, Fidel Baez. among many others. Another significant exhibition was uh, Pasha Yagta Wasichai, Indigenous Space, Modern Architecture, New Art, curated by Marcela Guerrero, the first Latina curator in the Whitney Museum of American Art. For the first time, this museum dedicated to the collection, exhibition, and preservation of artworks by US living artists presented um, an exhibition where contemporary Latinx artists of indigenous background share the same space. According to the press release of the show, they works investigate the complex relationship that indigenous and vernacular notions of construction, land, space, and cosmology have had in the history of modern and contemporary art and architecture in the Americas. Finally, the exhibition Afrosyncretic curated by Yelene uh, Rodriguez, confronted dominant narratives of what it means to be Latinx by foregrounding the African roots of several artists, including Lucia Hierro, Tiffany Alfonseca. I will show you some of the examples of the artists that participated in this show. What is interesting to me in this exhibition is Rodriguez's focus on Afro-Latinx, Afro-Caribbean artists to deconstruct the continental idea of Latinx as a totalizing identity. In the crucial essay, Disturbing Categories Remaping Knowledge, an historian Tatiana Flores evidenced how Latinx has narrowly been associated with people of color of predominantly indigenous heritage why black artists of African descent are frequently excluded in exhibitions from a Latin American perspective. Afro-Latinos represent a quarter of the total population. However, they have been rendered invisible in Latin America, including the Hispanophone Caribbean through the national narratives of mestizaje. So what does the Latinx category offer uh, artists like Juana Valdez and curators like me? How do we renegotiate our identities by embracing Latinx? Understanding my practice in relation to the concepts of curatorial activism and feminist curating, 
I am frequently motivated by a sense of urgency and imperious need to explore archives from a critical perspective in order to render visible forgotten subjects and to promote new discourses and the production of meaning in relation to the present moment. Though it's not complicated for me to assume the Latin X identity, as it implies recognizing the long ignored contributions of Latin X artists to the history of US American art, as well as it allows a space of reflection of the politics of participation of communities from Latin America in the US. Latin X is a flexible category, which you don't need to identify with if you don't want to. It challenges the binary, black and white, feminine and masculine, and it's about intersectionality, it's about inclusivity, and it's about justice. I think of Juana and I as border subjects who struggle through the colonial difference while also reflecting complex and heterogeneous uh, realities that supersede any form of essentialism. I remember an article by a scholar, Victoria Lopez Fernandez, where she argues that the concept of border is implicit in the notion of diaspora from a metaphorical and symbolical perspective. Diaspora identities simultaneously belong and do not belong to the place of origin as much as they belong and do not belong to the adopted place. In this rigor, the consciousness of the diaspora implies a sense of difference and multiplicity, a sense of otherness, and therefore of displacement. Living in the diaspora is living in the third country, in the contaminated and intersectional zone, or as Guillermo Gomez Peña, artist Guillermo Gomez Peña, reminds us is to live in the borderlands. I immigrated to Miami in 2016 adapting to a life in a city that exists as a third space, as defined by Chicana, feminist, poet, poet and theorist Gloria and Saldua. A third space where people from multiple nationalities converge, where language cross-pollinates and are revitalized. According to Ansaldua, a third space is where a new consciousness that is defined by multiple identities emerge. I like to think of Latinx as this new consciousness, as Dalsua originally refers to the borderland between Mexico and the US, I extrapolate her notion and interpret Miami as a border space or a third space between the Americas. Thus, by embracing the multifaceted political dimensions of this borderline, I strive to challenge the patriarchal and racist ideologies of our institutions and history. To end, I would like to conclude with these words uh, by Teresita Fernandez that I love, um, um, Iceland's universe is the name of this piece, and also with this inspirational quote from the last book of Por Preciado that I read when the quarantine started. And that quote says, the old regime, political, sexual, and ecologic, criminalize all practice of crossovers. But where crossing is possible, the map of a new society starts to be drawn with new forms of production and the reproduction of life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very important and interesting talk. I think there was a lot of things uh, I also learned. And um, yeah. Same so here. thank you so much. And maybe also uh, to the audience, you mentioned it um, already. Uh, briefly that you actually put together a resource list, which is really very generous of you. Yeah. And, uh, you all can actually access it via the 154 um, forum website. It will be linked to um, the announcement of this talk. So um, if you're interested, it's like a very comprehensive list of books, conferences, artists, um, everything that 
Adele also um, just mentioned now in her talk. So also very much thank you for that. Yes, so we have questions from the audience and um, we're gonna read them to you now, Adele. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope um, they are clear, they sound quite clear to me. And um, yeah, I hope um, we can go through them now. So uh, one question from the audience is, um, how can one transcend this representation and movement, the Latinization into the everyday artist nuance, especially if you are an artist and can be influenced by Latin art, such as colors, traditions, etc., etc. I am of African descent and an artist and use very similar and bold cause to represent my contemporary art. And bold cause meaning the critics content as mentioned in your representation, a presentation note. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, can you repeat what, it, what is the question? <laughs> yes, 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 I can read it again. It's a bit long, but <laughs> yeah. so, um, um, this is a question from an artist of African descent. Um, okay. And um, she or he is asking, how can one transcend this representation and movement, the Latinization into the everyday artist nuance? especially if you are an artist and can be influenced by Latin art such, such, uh, such as colors, traditions, etc. So um, this question from um, her or his, um, let's say African perspective, um, yeah. that's how I understood it. Yes, yeah. how can one transcend this, transcend this representation and movement, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of course, the thing is how you identify yourself. I think that's the first. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I said that I was through this experience of being Black, Cuban, Hispanic, Latino, it's about speaking how multiple identity are, how complicated they are, and how you can take advantage of all of them. So um, for me, it's more because at the end, when I wake up every day, I don't say, okay, well, I am all of this, mm -hmm. but it's about how I implement, I implement all of these elements that conform myself. And I make something in my case, I think that needs to be useful for um, the atmosphere of the environment in which I am. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, as, every construction is about okay how you identify yourself and how through your work you may be interested or not in following because i can say it, um there is certain a stereotypical representation about where if you are latina your world needs to be colorful of you are a black artist is that kind of stereotypes so i think that in the same way that we embrace the identities, we need to be uh, in the position to separate of them mm -hmm. and trying to uh, use them as mm -hmm. political instruments to affect change in institutions. So that's for me the main uh, thing in terms of how we can transcend the represent the this process of labeling. Um, how, how we can go beyond that and mm. of course always think on yourself how do you identify how do you feel uh good with yourself and yeah that's mm -hmm. that's my opinion mm -hmm. yeah thank you there is a second question which i think really ties in with with that um mm -hmm which is basically um, looking at its history and context. If I am, so the, the person who's asking the question, not me, if I'm a cis female, does using Latin X make sense for me? I believe it makes it more inclusive, such as using E in Spanish, uh, todes or nosotros being examples, but I don't want to ut utilize something that isn't mine to use. Again, it's about how do you recognize yourself in uh, for example, and that's what I make sometimes, I will say I am not too personal when I write or when I speak, but um, doing a presentation about identities, 
I don't feel in the position to speak about how other person can, can feel in these terms. I embrace Latinx because I consider that the term identifies me that um, and in that um, with this same idea, I like how Arlene Davila in her recent book, she speak about uh, she speaks about Latinx as a project, and that also gives you the idea of how mutable it can be. So for me, as a feminist person, as a person that has migrated, as a person that is trying to find a space in the United States to be represented, to have a voice, I think that Latinx allows me that possibility, allows me the opportunity to approach to the work of other artists. But mm -hmm. it's about how it's not like it's not a trendy thing. It's not like okay, this is the topic, and we need to. I this is the new movement. I need to be part of that. It's like if you recognize yourself or not. You can. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is the difference between um, gender identity and sexual orientations. Being queer not necessarily means that you. Are half a, um, for example, if you are gay or bisexual, it is not related. So I think that's the other, the other part. Thanks so much. There's another question, maybe the last question of today, because you know you talked so much and uh, gave us so much already, um, so many insights and thoughts. So the last question is, um, um, how do um, mixed people? in brackets, white and Latinx uh, fit into another identity question. So <laughs> again, sorry, how do mixed people like white plus Latinx fit uh, fit into um, the identity of Latinx? So <laughs> how white people? No, how, um, how do mixed people, for example, white plus Latinx fit into um, the identity of Latinx? So if you're mixed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how mixed people, white, um, plus. white with plus Latinx. Mm -hmm. How do they fit into um, the idea of the Latinx identity? Well, um, I will respond, which I think that I understand from the question. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that Latinx is about um, intersectionality. It's about how we, um, and that's the other part, we can speak about Afro-Latinos, we can speak about pe um, people in Latin America that have Asian descent that are from, for example, Korea, uh, mm -hmm. from other places of the world, and yeah. how all of them can be represented in the Latin X spectrum. So yeah. I think, yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's right. And uh, what, that what, what, makes totally sense. Um, exactly. What you already uh, mentioned, I guess, you know, now we have also here a comment by one from the audience who says, well, actually, Latin X is inherently yeah. mixed. No, mixed. this is what yeah. you're also saying. It actually really comes from all these aspects that you, that you were um, mentioning before. Also, maybe there was also a response from um, Stephen, who was the one who asked the very first question. Uh, and so he said, yes, thank you for mentioning the stereotypes. Then there are then there's a lot of backlash and cultural appropriation context recently in our society. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense also. And there's another comment by um, Natalie Albin saying, this talk has been so enlightening particularly for someone finding their identity in a country outside Latin America. Thank you. So, um, Thank you. And, yes, and maybe another one. Um, I think Latin X is inclusive of the uh, heterogeneous backgrounds that compose Latin American cultures and identities rather than an exclusive racialized or ethnic concept. It's social political, it's social political, I feel. So now uh, more comments. Uh, comments are coming. Are coming you now. So yeah. So I think we're all very much um, agreeing with you. Were what you were mentioning. It is really about this being heterogeneous and mixed and defining yourself, how you position yes. yourself. Right. I think this makes it really 
so strong as a concept, I guess, that it is about self-identification, but at the same time also really open um, and not um, yeah. in that sense. So I did thank and you maybe, so much yeah. again um, for this yes, great talk. I mean, we can see with people like responding now that this is yeah. not really touching a nerve yes. on the topic. Yes. So um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you're all welcome to just follow also our data's work. I think it really goes uh, into these directions with everything you do in your research and your creatorial work. So I think there will be a lot of more really important things to see and hear um, from yeah. you. Um, of yeah. course, um, I let my email. So, so thanks so much. Wants to follow up, wants to know more, wants information. I am open wow. and reachable. So, wow, thanks. this is really great. So, yeah, so this is very generous of you. Uh, I <laughs> hope you all take that opportunity and, um, yeah, get in touch with our data. So, um, thank you everyone Hello. for tuning in. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget that the forum just kicked off. Yeah, it's just and the beginning. <laughs> much more coming on Saturday and on Sunday. So we hope some of you also find their way back uh, for a lot of more conversations that actually will then maybe go really more deeper into what you kind of laid out now for us and yeah. looking at very specific uh, contexts and conversations within these identifications that you um, so brilliantly um, described for us. So oh, Aldeide, thanks so much for this fantastic Thank kickoff. You. That helped us a lot. <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks to the audience. They're clapping as well. Um, yeah, so a lot of uh, comments coming in now saying thank you. That was a great talk. So, so have a nice uh, rest of the day or the evening or the night, wherever you are. And um, yeah, see you soon. And thanks again, Aldeida. Yeah? Okay.